have stopped. Yeah, they have. Thank you very much. Um, this is weaponizing layer eight, and in the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'd like to talk to you about what la uh, layer eight actually means and why we should talk about that. So, for those of you not really familiar with uh, layer eight, layer eight is a term that we in the infosec industry or IT generally have used to describe users, the stupid people using our systems. And we also have called them other names like um, PEPCAC, which is short for peop uh, Problem Exists Between Keyboard and Chair. Our idiots, basically, and uh, this was some kind of negative thinking, I think, that some people in the industry still have. When we call our colleagues and people that use our systems the weakest link, we are not really doing them justice, I think. And this talk is relevant because, as we prove day by day, we in the industry alone aren't really managing in, uh, we are not really capable to solve our problems in the industry. And we won't be able to solve them without the people using our systems. So the problem is to get them on board. The other alternative that every vendor at RSA, for example, that is running now um, will tell you is just buy a box and put the box in the network. Probably leave it unconfigured and it will solve your security problems. Um, little spoiler, it probably won't. What the box will do is they will create a lot of screens and a lot of information and a lot of dashboards for your secure operation center. and. Um, it will be just wasted information because at the end of the day you will have not secured some of your humans and my firm conviction is that humans matter. The original version of this talk was created together with um, Brian Feit and some of the things you see in the talk are attributed to him. This humans matter um, is from his own conference as well. So. Before we get into how we can actually um, weaponize our, our colleagues, I would like to talk to you about how I think cyber actually impacts the physical domain. Let's start with something funny. Uh, I've brought, and I've said that I've brought a lot of gummy bears. And when I did that, I realized that I wouldn't be able to throw them at anyone because A, I suck at throwing, and B, you're quite far away. So uh, I'll just leave them there. If you fancy that stuff, then just um, grab some after my talk. Still, I wouldn't mind you participating in show of hands if you want to. Who of you has heard uh, of the great German pizza wars five, six years ago? So for all of you who haven't, five or six years ago, we had two main portals selling fast food. So you logged on, you fancied a pizza or you fancied a burger, and you put your order in, and the portal would just send the nearest delivery service to your home. So basically the same, like I think Deliveroo and others, what, what you have in your country. But the funny thing about um, the two major players in Germany was they started DDoSing each other on Saturday nights. So basically the idea was if the other guy couldn't get the order, then I'm getting the order, but if both are DDoSing um, then the other one, then nobody's getting the order. So people went unfed. A little bit more serious is, of course, um, WannaCry. So people who are not really computer savvy or aren't online at all were impacted by stuff that happens in the online world because um, hospitals couldn't do their job because their systems were just um, blocked by ransomware. And the last example where I learned the interesting term of swatting. Who of you knows what swatting is, basically? Yeah, that's very good. But how do we know it? Because there are idiots calling the police on somebody else. Because that is what swatting means, special weapons and assault team. And if you bear a grudge against somebody and maybe you are a teenager, then you just call the police and tell them there's something horrible going on at that house and probably you should go and have a look. So when I was a teenager, we didn't have the internet yet because gray hair stuff. Um, so I do remember a friend 
calling a few services to his neighbor because he hated him. And we found that funny at the time. But it wasn't the police. Uh, it was just the people you could call, like, um, I don't know, um, hospitals, the police we didn't call or he didn't call. So we thought that was funny. In retrospect, it was as dumb as this shit. But the one thing that happened, or the one example that I'm having, is um, when two people had an online fight about $1.50 in the game of uh, Call of Duty 3, I think it was, where the people, let's call them A and B, I do have the names, but they are really not that important. Um, A thought that B should give him the $1.50 for an online wager they had, and uh, B didn't feel like it. So A threatened to swat him, and B said, go ahead, this is my address. But he didn't give the right address, so he gave an address where he used to live years and years ago. And what happened is A asked his pal C to swat this guy. So C was uh, known and very notorious for calling the police on other people. He described a violent crime going on. He said the son already has murdered his father and he has cornered the rest of the family in the bathroom. And please, couldn't the police come and have a word with him? So the police went to the address that they had and they knocked. So person D opened the door and for some reason, we will never know, he, fa um, he got nervous because he looked into um, the guns of a few people, of the police people, and he reached for his waistband, maybe to scratch his ass. But the police took that for he was to draw a weapon because they thought a violent crime was going on, and they shot him, and they killed him for $1.50, which basically means that guy, who wasn't even online, who wasn't even playing games, got shot because of something that went on in the cyber domain. So it isn't a question whether cyber impacts the physical domain. I think that is pretty much um, been proven. It does. And it doesn't even have the need of you to be online or um, in any way interested in cyber. So how could we empower people? How can we get our colleagues to be better at security, because we tried for years, or we as the industry, um, to just tell them they should be more secure, and somehow that didn't work. Uh, so we came up with a few interesting examples. I hope they are interesting to you as well. So who of you has heard of the old trope of the pen tester that just leaves a few USB drives at the parking lot, and at some point they have network access because people are going to plug them in. I've heard the story. And actually, um, it has been validated by, um, by, 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 by the University of Illinois. Um, I was looking for that. And they handed up out about uh, 300 USB drives, and about half of them got plugged in. So how do you counter that? Because the thing is, most of us are still really helpful or we want to help. If you were working at a company, you found a USB drive at the parking lot and it had a set of keys with it and maybe a little toy figure, um, wouldn't you want to plug it in and see what's on it just to find out who the person was to return it? Or if you're a greedy person, wouldn't you like to plug it in if it was labeled Bitcoin wallet or maybe finances 2019? So as an attacker, I have uh, a lot of social engineering vectors to make it more interesting and to get people to really plug it in. And basically, I'm talking to a room full of security researchers or people interested in the topic. So who of you wouldn't plug it in? Of course we would plug it in, but of course we think we would do it in a secure environment and we would um, be very wary of the device. But we built something that we called uh, or call the, the virus detention station. The way that works is you need to um, authenticate with your company card, and then you plug in a USB drive, uh, you get all the files on the drive, you select those that you want at your office PC, and you click send, and once you're back at your office PC, you will have a link to, to a network drive, and you can download them. Pretty easy. 
Why did we build that? We didn't have in mind that people should be able to plug in USB drives they found at the parking lot. I would like to acquaint you with something that is uh, a story directly from big companies. If you're working for a small company, that's cool. If you're working for a big company, that might be cool as well. But both have their own dangers, let's say. And big companies like my company, um, we do have some processes that are really, really stupid if you have a closer look at it. So, assuming I wanted to have a presentation and uh, I had to give it the next day and I worked on it yesterday and I wanted to bring it to the office. I wasn't allowed to do that because the USB drive would have to have put in an envelope. That envelope gets sent to a different building in the same city. Somewhere there, some kind of magic would happen and they would label it, they would seal it, and they would put it in an envelope and the internal postal service would bring it back to my desk. And this would take about how long? What do you think? Three days if you were really, really lucky, more often four or five days. So if you really have something important going on, then it wouldn't work. Again, assuming you have a presentation that you have to give the next day, what are you going to do? Are you going to follow proper process? No, you won't. So people would just plug uh, the USB drives into their office PCs and just keeping fingers crossed that everything is okay. But with building that um, virus detention station, basically what we did is we gave them the, op the option to have it sooner. And now you can plug in any kind of USB drive that you find. Well, there's company policy again. Um, what do you think happens according to the written down company policy if somebody finds a USB drive lying at the parking lot? They should hand it over to building security. So far, so good. What is building security going to do with a USB drive? So, the written procedure is they hand it to the communal lost and found, which is three kilometers away. And um, the USB drive gets lost, basically, because you could throw it away. Um, I still want to go there and say, you know, I've lost the USB drive. Um, it's black about that size. Do you have one? <laughs> and see, see what happens. That would be interesting. So we're still working on that part. Uh, the people responsible for that said, um, why this process is working? Why should we change anything? That's the fun when you're working in a big company. But basically, now people can uh, use thumb drives the way thumb drives are meant to be used. The next thing I would like to talk about is uh, phishing. And of course, phishing is still also something that is very effective if you want to get into networks, if you want to get people to click on links. And short question to the audience, which of these links is malicious? And, of course, it is terribly difficult to spot that uh, without any kind of research. Link shortness like Bit, uh, and, and Google and whatnot are making it nearly impossible to see whether this link is malicious or it isn't. You have to follow it and you have to have a look and then you can maybe tell if it's malicious. Amazon with an O, uh, with a zero as an O, this is actually a link that gets back to Amazon because they have the domain and this is the IP address of our um, our own website so it's and, and the last link actually the first link goes to security and the last link goes to the slides so they should be up tomorrow evening I think but my point is we try to get users to read mail headers we try to get users to read links and to interpret um, whether a mail was malicious or not. And it's been a long time since I've read mail headers to find out whether a mail is malicious or not. And Brian came up with the term, we should look for indicators of bullshit, because that is much more easy, much easier. And um, I'm going to into the indicators, and I hope you will, uh, you will agree that if there's one or more of these indicators in an email, you can safely throw it away in a business context because this is not going to be anything you want to deal with. First thing, as always, is money. 
Because at the end of the day, um, people want to make money and the scammers want to get your money. Or this is the end goal. So whenever someone in a mail wants money from you, then just get very suspicious because why? And it doesn't matter what the context is, just get very suspicious. And that's also for, um, for private emails as well. Very often this goes together with um, threats. So the threat is you could buy, a, a, you could get an email saying, we noticed that you downloaded this software. This software is our intellectual property. So you need to buy, uh, you need to pay us 200 euros and we will let it slip. But if you don't, we're just actually, um, we are going to sue you and probably will end up paying 5,000 euros. So this is a threat. Another threat is just implying that somebody uh, has done something illegal because this is a motivator as well. Most of us do not want to do something illegal. And if you get a mail saying, um, we noticed that you did that and that, that is illegal, and just to clean the slate, to, um, to make your name good again, you have to pay this fair amount. Um, it's something for most of us where we would react and say, okay, um, out of fear, maybe, um, I'm going to do that even if I'm not sure I did that, but the risk is too high. Another good indicator of bullshit is romance. And I'm using the term very loosely. So whenever you get a mail from a nice Russian lady who really has developed an interest in you and you alone, um, then just think about the context and think about wh where she got your name. One of the spam emails I got uh, years ago that I still very, very much cherish in my heart started with, um, we found your name in the database of rel uh, reliable persons in Germany. <laughs> Me? <laughs> cool. Um, but flattering, of course, and romance and things like that and uh, are good indicators as well. And one indicator that nearly every time plays some kind of role as well is urgency. As for my example earlier on, you pay 80 euros now and you're okay, or 5,000 euros later because we need to sue you. There's always a time limit, like you have to do it within the next 24 hours or 48 hours, but very often this is a very short time limit. And that is a quite nifty psychological trick because as soon as you put somebody uh, to a decision and give them only a small amount of time, the brain works differently as if you don't have a time limit. Because you, you just don't really think thoroughly about it. You think about the consequences, what happens. And if the time limit is already ticking, um, then you are probably paying. It's some of the ransomware does that as well. Like, just pay us within the next six, six hours or the price will triple. So you're not thinking well. And all of these indicators actually um, are for business emails as well as private emails. And the next thing that's also a little bit psychological, and I still need to do a field test on that, but when we read emails or when people read emails, they want to do something with it. So either you want to answer or you want to tick that box that you've dealt with that email. Just putting it to trash doesn't really satisfy that need to do something with the email. So in your business context, if you can put in a button that says forward this email to your security team, whoever your security team is, might be a secure operation center or your mail security team, whatever, um, then as somebody who got a, a fish or a spam, I can click the button, the mail gets forwarded to the relevant people, and I feel good about it because it has been dealt with. And Every social awareness platform that does phishing campaigns um, that I have uh, looked at does that kind of thing. They implement a button where you can just deal with the email because then it's out of your mind. And it's actually a very good thing, not for the Secure Operations Center because those guys very often complain that they get such a lot of spam. It's not their spam, it's the spam that's going to be sent to them. 
But on the other hand, this, these are always fishes and um, emails that pass all of your controls. That means the domains are not blacklisted yet, whatever the attachment is, is not recognized yet. So it's a valuable source of Intel, actually, to um, tweak your filters. So it benefits, um, it's beneficial to all, all sides. And now comes one of the things I really love to talk about, that is reverse social engineering. And I've got an example for you. Who of you has heard about CEO fraud? So CEO fraud basically has nothing to do at all with computers. It's just a plain old scam. And to put it, well, it's, 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 it's very simplifying, but basically someone claiming to be the CEO of a company sends a mail to somebody within the company and says, you know, um, I'm in country X. We really need to acquire company Z. Can we make a transfer of 300, 300,000 euros today? So, of course, the person that is targeted will be in finances and they will have the ability to do that, hopefully. But very often there is, uh, again, written procedures that do not allow the person to do that. But what do you do if you get a, a mail from the CEO? You might act upon that. And if that goes on, then basically the poor person at the company will end up transferring money to a scammer because they've been social engineered. Um, the fake CEO said this had to be done, and they followed up with it. This is something that sounds very silly if I simplify it, and if I just say, basically, somebody from the outside says, give me money, and people in the company do that. But please bear in mind that Google and Facebook fell for that for $100 million combined, and there are many companies who've fall for that in the millions. This is not a scam that brings in a few thousand euros. You really, if you do that and if you pull that off, you get millions because you target companies that are big enough. One of the companies at the places where I live, that is Nuremberg in Germany, um, fell for that scam and they shelled out 40 million euros. Hope, the good thing was it didn't really um, break the whole company, but it put a dent into, um, into, into their cash flow. Of course it did. So, what could we actually do to make that better? And another company in Nuremberg came up with a hilarious idea. So they got so many emails with CEO fraud that they got bored with it. They really got annoyed. And what they did was they told every employee, you know, if you get an email, just forward it to the SOC. And the SOC would then go and change the email address slightly so that it's not noticed and start communicating with um, the scammer. They would say, oh, CEO, very nice to hear from you. And you know, I am not allowed to transfer such large, large sums of money, but probably you have forgotten that we have this, this very new brand new payment portal. Payment portal? Yeah, we do have the payment portal and you can do all of your transfers yourself. Have you forgotten your login details? And as a scammer, of course, I've forgotten my login details because I've never had them in the first place. So they ask for user ID and password. They're getting it. They are logging on. They are ticking a box saying, yeah, 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 I've read, I've read terms and conditions and everything's okay. And they are presented with a portal where you can enter who should receive the money, um, which account, and how much. So basically, as a scammer, that's the checkpoint, right? Because if I can transfer the money to myself and I don't need anybody else, then that is very good. Except, of course, um, it does not happen. What happens is that at the moment where the scammer presses send or transfer, the I then, so um, the long number describing the account and the account name um, is getting blacklisted. And it's a lot more difficult uh, to get a new bank account than it is to get a new email address. I guess uh, this is something that most of you will agree to. So this company is building up a list with blocked items because they are used for fraudulent purposes. And at the moment, we are trying to build a database on that and we're trying to share the information. But the funny thing is, if you're one of the good guys trying to stick to GDPR, 
um, then you're not really allowed to do that because you haven't asked the scammer whether he's okay with um, you using their personal data. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so at the moment, we we still try to figure out a way uh, how we can share the data and make it accessible for all the people who would have an interest in that. But again, human rights and other things come into play. The very good thing is, at the end of the day, the scammer won't have the money, and they will have been tricked into giving out valuable information um, without having anything in return. I'd also like to talk a little bit about passwords. I know this is one of the topics that is controversial and that is still something that we need at the moment, but still, I think there's so many things that need to be said about passwords, especially with uh, the discussion about password safes uh, during the last one or two weeks. I mean, a strong password is always better than something that you can come up with um, or that a non-security person can come up with if it comes from a password safe or if it is generated. If it's generated and if it's really, really good, then the chances are that you won't be able to actually um, keep it in mind, especially if you have passwords that are different for the hundreds of websites and logins that you're using. So the left one would be a very good password, but do you know why it isn't? Sorry? Can you remember it? Uh, no, not because of the remembering, but it's on a slide that is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something um, that most of my passwords look, because I can't remember them. I've got them in my password safe, and I've got a password that I hopefully can remember to access my password safe. And even if somebody is, is holding a gun at my temple and telling me I should tell them my passwords, I can't because, uh, again, old and I'm going to forget them anyway, so why not have the safe remembering them? So I think we can agree on that. What we probably can't agree upon, at least a few people can't, is when, you, when you're talking about um, colleagues or empowering layer 8 or other people who are not as tech savvy, then I like to take into account also uh, your NAN, for example, or your, um, your friends that are not online and older people who are a little bit online every now and then, have a Facebook account or any other account where they do a little bit of stuff. And very often, if you can get them to use a password safe, that's great. Then they should use a password safe, nothing wrong with that. On the other hand, if they don't want to do that, then let them write the passwords down in a little notebook. The thing is, we as an industry are very, very keen, or some of us are very keen to say, this is not secure. And, well, if you have a look at everyone and try to find something one size fits all for everybody, everyone, then you might be right. But if there's a burglar standing in your grandmother's flat next to the computer flipping through the password book, this burglar doesn't exist, because if the burglar is in that flat, he's looking for valuables, he's looking for money, he's looking for jewelry, he's looking for other stuff. And even if he's flipping through the frigging password book, then you just change your passwords afterwards, because you know he's been there. But there's no harm in letting them write down their passwords, and if they can write down their passwords, then they are going to be better than password 1, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and all the other stuff that we see year by year as the top 10 passwords in the world. So this is something to think about. If they want to use 2FA or MFA, then let them. This is always great. But I think we need to have a little bit of a change of thinking and think about that 10% of security is better than 0% and we can't get everybody to 100% or 99% or 98 So everything we can implement, we should do, but if people are not really interested in it, we can't force them to do it, so let's find a way how we can make it reasonably safe. It doesn't have to be completely safe. And if you think that this is a bad approach, then please also think about um, 
that guy who ignores his smartphone security and his role in the world and whether he or whether your nan needs a better security than the president of the United States of America. It's just something to think about. One thing I haven't seen in the wild, um, and there are reasons for that, is um, kind of a mail forward as a service. Again, to protect the people at your company, um, you could have, you could register a domain that has nothing to do with your company and offer everyone a forwarding email address. So the reason for that is your email address, if you only have one, I'm assuming most of you in the room have way more than one, uh, but most people who are online just have one email address and that is their most critical asset because if I as an attacker control the email address, I control all their accounts. Because what happens if I reset the password? It gets sent to the email address for that account. And if I can read that, I can get into any account for that email address. If you forward that, if I register at the platforms with a um, forwarded email address, then you, even if that platform gets breached, they do know my forwarded email address, they still do not know my real email address, and it's harder to attack. On the other hand, there are many problems with what if the person leaves the company and so on and so forth. Um, this is why we haven't implemented it yet, but I think this would be a good idea, even um, if you can get people to have forwarded email address to their real email address. That is just one more layer of abs uh, abstraction that makes it harder to attack them. And one thing I also want to... Uh, probably most of you won't be um, giving awareness trainings, I'm assuming. But if you are working at a company, then most of you will probably receive awareness trainings, which can or cannot be something that is really, really bad. We do have something called Virtual Training Company, and it's like a flash game from the 90s, where you have to walk through a virtual company and you see... <gasps> That bin is on fire. What do I do? Well, I go for a coffee. I'll grab the fire extinguisher. I call security. So it's, it's bloody stupid. And it's actually, I think some of the questions are just insulting because, um, yeah, of course it's, uh, you don't go for a coffee if there's a, um, burning rubbish bin. But on the other hand, I'm working in various companies since 1990. I've never really encountered a, burning rubbish bin. So it's it's not a use case that has to be dealt with daily. And another thing is fear, uncertainty, doubt are enemies of security in my eyes because they always tend to, fear tends to be something that is really powerful. If you want to get somebody to um, modify their behavior, fear is something that will help you in the short run until that person realize, realizes they've been tricked and then they will show the opposite of the behavior that you wanted to have. Uncertainty is always bad and doubt because you should make very clear what you're up to, what people have to do or should do. And have to do again is a is bad wording because uh, you need to get them on board. You shouldn't talk down to them, but I'm getting to that later. If you're Doing awareness trainings, don't do multiple choice click tests because it's always C, right? Um, somebody tried various uh, multiple choice forms and the solutions and they always ticked C and they never got a passing grade, but C is very often the option that you have to tick if there's only one choice. And nobody really likes to do that. So there was... Uh, the human hacker, Jenny Radcliffe, there was one of her podcasts with Kai Rear where they were, were discussing that they would love if people were at the water cooler being excited about the next security awareness training. But nobody is. It's like, yeah, it's the bloody training again today. Crap. So maybe we can do something to make that better. What we did, and this is very sneaky, I know, um, we didn't call it security awareness training. It's just different formats. Um, one thing is uh, called Long Night of the Sciences. This is open to the public. This is um, every two years. All kinds of companies just open their 
their doors and show show off what they're doing. Um, we educated people that we didn't know um, about password security and other stuff just by talking about it, trying to make it interesting, trying to engage them. And um, I recently learned that one girl now is uh, having an apprenticeship starting this year because she saw us doing that there. So you're reaching people, you just don't know whether you've reached them or not. And you should have open formats, I think. So unlike here, I mean, please don't, but you are free to leave if you wanted to, but this is still a closed room. If you have some kind of open office space, we're just talking about security and chatting, not just one person just always talking on themselves, but having some kind of discussion, and you can come and go as you please, then people feel more comfortable, because if they get bored, they can just leave and nobody um, bats an eye. And using multiple channels really works well as well, because we all take in information differently, so we are writing blogs, we are doing those kind of formats where you can come and go, where we do discussions, um, we do talks internally, and it's all different formats. The only thing is, if you do it after hours, then just please don't be a dick. Just be as nice and provide drinks as, at least, and a few crisps, because people will stay if they have free beer or gummy bears. Maybe. Hopefully. One more thing that a lot of companies do, but only to a certain extent, is stalking themselves. So very often you have some kind of automatic, uh, um, some kind of mechanism that will scan your company from the outside, but very often that is just port scanning, right? You check whether there are new ports open or whether the old ones are still working. And that is fair and well enough. Sometimes you even hire somebody to do that, uh, but very often what you're doing is not seeing the complete picture. What do I mean by that? If you are only looking at the network level of your company, then you will miss out on the whole social media thing, and you will miss out on your users and what they are doing on the respective networks, Twitter, LinkedIn, Xing, what have you. So, what you can do, I mean, you can't really, very often you can't just monitor everyone in the company. We've got way more than 7,000 employees, and I'm not really interested what all of them are doing on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, I would fall asleep very quickly. But if you educate them, um, especially with the, with the job portals like um, LinkedIn, then you can have a really good result. What we had, we about half a year ago, there was a person acting or having a profile saying they belong to our company, and they were making friends with our clients. And they are making friends with people working at our company, really working at our company. And so because nobody really knew them, um, our users who were aware, very good, um, told us that there's something fishy going on. So we were able to shut down um, that profile very quickly, within a day. We still think this is not an attack that was targeting us, but we think this person wanted to look as if they were coming um, from us and targeting a third party, which is, in our case, we've got a really strange business, but I'm coming to that at the end if you're still interested. Um, this is not unusual for us, that we are not the target, but our clients are. And playing into this is also um, cyber risk management. So you're all familiar with um, threat intelligence, all right? presume. So threat intelligence is something that tells you um, interesting data, indicators of compromise about attacks that are happening now or that happened recently. Um, you will find out about IP addresses that might have attacked somebody or um, certain exploits that are just running right now. Maybe not, probably not against you, but against the third person and they are sharing the data with you. Um, risk is a little bit farther away from um, in, in the terms of the timeline because uh, a risk is something that might evolve into a threat, but it isn't a threat really just right now. 
One example is if you know that some of your users' emails and passwords have been breached on a different site, then you will know that this is a risk and somebody will try credential stuffing against your site with the same kind of um, credentials that have been lost on, let's say, Yahoo, because everybody was on Yahoo. And this, again, is something where you need to have time, where you need to have access to various data sources like the dark web and others, and where you have to research. It's nothing. It's not a solution out of the box where you just snip your fingers and you've got the information. It needs dedicated people trying to um, come up with the risks that your company is facing. But if you can identify those, then you can prepare accordingly, and that will be um, very valuable when the attack comes. And then finding the right language is very important. And a short intermission here, I already use cyber a lot, and I've also got a new t-shirt, cyber. Um, my, and I know a lot of the people in our industry do not like cyber. I'm sorry if you have to suffer through that. But as Dr. Jessica Barker said, all of our clients are going to refer to us um, with the term cyber. And if you don't go where our clients are, then we are leaving our clients in the dark. And this talk is about getting in touch with our clients, so I'm going to use cyber because they are using it. So, finding the right language. This is an example from last year's DEF CON. And the person writing that um, got evicted from the hotel very soon, but um, after talking to the DEF CON organizers, the hotel stuff was... Um, they, they let him in again, reluctantly, but they did. But if you only read that tweet without being in the security industry, then um, this might be scary, because just a few months before the tweet, a uh, shooter killed 58 people from his hotel room. So attacking people in Vegas is a little bit of a touchy subject. Um, if you just put that tweet out, then without context, that's bad. And context is something you need to give your users as well. Not talking down to them, of course, is the next thing, because everybody likes to be um, patronized, right? So we don't like it. Why should we do it with our colleagues? And there are ways of finding something, um, finding how we can talk to people. This is another example where um, I blanked out the users in most cases when it is uh, something where I'm not sure that it's still online. And that was somebody saying, come on, we as an industry are not that bad, right? And somebody who is developing um, apps and software said, personal opinion, yes, you are. And obviously, outside of our little bubble, people really don't like us that much. But this is due to um, us in the industry, most of the people um, talking down to users for 20 years. And it is changing. I'm happy it's changing. But just let's carry on um, searching for dialogue with people instead of just, you know, telling them what to do and what not. Another thing that you can avoid is ritual for ritual's sake. Whenever you identify a process in your company or something that doesn't make sense and people just do it because we've always done it that way, then just try to come up with uh, something better or say, we don't need that. This is one of the examples I found. <laughs> and I think it illustrates why it is very important to understand the security meshes and where they are implemented and whether they make, whether it makes sense to transfer them to other processes. In that case, of course, it doesn't. Another thing that might be more important than it looks like uh, at the first glance is um, locking your screens. So very often for a lot of the companies I worked for, they had this very good company culture saying, you know, all the attackers are on the outside. We don't have anyone on the inside who, who would be a bad guy or girl. Which might be right. On the other hand, if you consider that um, I don't have numbers from last year, but usually a lot of the attacks come from the inside as soon as you don't call them attacks, but also um, fuck-ups, for a better word, or people just clicking stuff without knowing what they're doing. They are not an attacker in the, in the traditional sense, but 
their actions result in a compromised network, so that makes them attackers. And very often, if your company is big enough, and if your company has interesting stuff or interesting data, then the chances that you have somebody that would steal the data if they are being offered 500k or maybe even 5,000k, uh, 5,000k, yeah, of course, uh, 5,000 euros or um, quid, then they would do it. So locking your screen and not giving other people access to your mail, to everything that is open on your um, laptop, is really important. Basically, what we are doing um, is amateur hour. Um, I, I get to the pro version, but if I see an unlocked screen of one of my teammates, I'm going to send an email to the team saying, tomorrow there's free cake. I'm going to provide free cake or maybe a beer after work. Something small, something that doesn't cost too much um, because people then follow up on it. You know, if you return to your desk and you find out that you um, promised cake for 10 people the next day, then most people are not enough of a dick to not follow up on that and they will bring cake. But they will also lock their screen the next day. Or at least after two or three times. And when I say this is the amateur version, um, after giving that talk at another conference, somebody came up to me and said, you know what we do? We've got macros rolled out via group policy, so I only have to press this and that key combination and that my mail goes out automatically. But yeah, <laughs> that's one way to do it. Uh, we are not that professional in that respect. And something that you have to bear in mind is it's no use to have one dedicated security person within a team and teach them and give them all the advice and they have to be the um, multiplicator and get it into the team and things like that because it doesn't work. Uh, you have to educate every individual. The way that works, works very well for us is uh, when we're doing trainings or giving security awareness advice, we are rarely talking about the office. We are very often talking about how the people can protect themselves at home because people are more interested in that. And very often they have the feeling that if they are at their office PC, they are protected anyway because we've got loads of people doing security and uh, they have the feeling they are protected anyway. It doesn't really help when they click phishing links, but for the personal life, and they are more appreciative of what they hear. And so um, the whole education really works well if you educate everyone. And I know I still have some minutes, but I thought originally I was too quick, so I, I went through something a little bit faster. Um, I'm nearly at the end. Um, we were talking about stock photos at the beginning, and I also have a lot of stock photos. This is my favorite stock photo. Um, somebody used it like, <laughs> I've got root. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I want to say is, uh, we should also eat our own dog food. There's nothing worse than the security team not actually doing what they tell other people to do, and I've had that at my company as well. We had a security team, and if you wanted to do a proof of concept with any kind of appliance, new software, whatever, um, you would get some network share at the end of the universe, so to speak, with no connection to anything, and you had to be confined to that and be happy. You couldn't access it really, you couldn't test it really, but everything else was too scary. So imagine my surprise when I was invited to be part of a proof of concept for software that they evaluated, and it was just in the office network, you know? No firewalls, no borders, because that's how it works, and it's much easier. And stuff like that really makes me angry, because if you have security guidelines, everybody should stick to them, especially the people writing the damn guidelines. Because if you can't follow the guidelines, um, who else should, you know? Um, makes it senseless. So basically, I hope I get across the point that it doesn't really make a difference if you, oh, for some reason, um, this just went out, but you're not really missing out on a lot. But if somebody from um, the technical point of view could actually have a look, I wouldn't mind, because 
I can hold that up, but it's no use. But the slide says conclusion and call for action at the moment. My conclusion and my call for action is please think about hiring more people and getting more security awareness out there in a meaningful way instead of instead of anything. Don't know. Doesn't matter. They are really, I promise you, the slides that come now are really boring. No more funny memes. Well, the, the very last slide is very funny, but um, I think. <laughs> but on the other hand, we can't show it to you. Doesn't matter. So instead of uh, investing into new appliances that just give more work to your SOC or more data that is not relevant, just please try to invest it in, in your people. And also know your threats, especially know your threats when it comes to social and when it comes to other things um, that are user-related and not tech-related. I've put in some links. Uh, you can take a photo of that slide just now. <laughs> but they will be... Um, bear with me. My website is called uh, cyberstuff. Oh, yeah, right. Thank you very much. Um, and I will put the slides online, as I said, probably tomorrow evening, and you will have the links there. Uh, that's just a little bit about the stuff that we, we have been talking about. I also am um, a regular on the Sun Security podcast in English, which is probably more valuable to you, because I also do the German Sun Security podcast. You're happy to listen to it, but if you don't understand German, it might be even more confusing. And thank you very much for listening. My name is Stefan Hager. My handle is at K. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I appreciate that. You can have gummy bears for that, and that is a very cheap way to persuade you. Um, I work for a company called Dativ in Germany, and what we are doing is we are writing software for tax accountants and tax consultants. And this sounds, for everybody outside of Germany, like something that is pretty boring. It probably is, but it is a big market in Germany. So we have 7,000 people, and we are, I think, amongst the five largest software producers in Germany, just behind Microsoft and SAP. So it's a really big market in Germany. But they say that 70% of world literature on tax is written in German. Um, so they might be right. As for the last and hopefully slightly funny slide, are there any questions? Yeah, so the question is, what do I think about um, mock phishing attempts and social awareness campaigns? Uh, I think it depends on the company culture. And it depends on what you're doing with the users and what happens if somebody accidentally cl clicks a fish. If you are in the kind of company where that is very hierarchical and where any kind of mistake will give you the slip, then this is a really bad idea. If you have um, a rather good aware user base and they know that this is happening and you can gamify it um, to a point where you can actually have a list where you see you're better than marketing um, or your department is. Uh, so never go down to the individual, just make it teams. It can be a good idea if you repeat it say three times a year, maybe four times a year. Not more often because that becomes annoying. Um, on the other hand, I think, and I'm a firm believer in that, I don't know how I can get there, but I think a user at the office PC should be able to click anything they see without any kind of fear, because it's the job of the security team to make sure that they can click anything without anything happening. At the moment, we have that in our company because our office network is not connected to the Internet. So, yeah, click on the fish. And that is why all the social media... We, we had um, social awareness campaign people trying to get us to, uh, to buy their product. And whenever we said, you know, we have that, we have separated our network from the Internet, and B, no, we won't whitelist your fake domains, because that is not the test. We won't whitelist the domains for any scanner. So please try it in these environments with these constraints, because this is how a criminal would have to act. 
um, nobody took up the, the chance to improve on that. Any other questions? And I can throw gummy bears, but I'm re I really suck at that. So if I wanted to throw them to you, I... Sorry in advance. Uh, I'll get it. Yeah, see. Questions? Sorry. No more questions? Um, I'm the one standing between you and the break, so I won't do that any longer. Thank you very much. <laughs>